Um, I am happy to be here. It's good to see all of you again. It, I'm very fortunate in that I consider that I have three church families. One in Escondido where I pastored for 18 years and now I'm a member there. One in Corona where I pastored for 18 years and one here in Laguna where I was here for nine months. It is good to see all of you again. From Paul's introduction to Romans, there is this word. To all in Laguna who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, two weeks ago Thursday, I received a phone call from the pastor at Escondido saying, Pastor Gary, Pastor Lafitte's going to be out of town, the associate pastor. The associate pastor said, something's come up for me, I'm supposed to preach, can you preach for me? So I said, yes. And normally when I'm preaching, I usually preach exegetical sermons, although I preach mostly topical sermons here because of what was taking place. And so normally I'm thinking two or three weeks ahead, but I was even thinking two or three weeks ahead when I was here working on two or three sermons at the same time. So I didn't have anything I was working on, but the pastor there has done something which I think is a great thing. He has started giving out a list every month, and the passage he's going to preach on is, is listed uh, by week. And we were in the middle, of, he was in the middle of preaching on Romans. So I looked at that and I thought, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll follow through on that. And I told him I would. And so I started studying and reading. And just, just a warning. If I step on your toes during the sermon, that's okay because mine got hurt a lot when I was studying it, okay? J just saying, very honestly. But when I... Look, have been studying it for a bit. I, I sent a text to the secretary there. I said, here's my title. How then shall we live? But I got to thinking, you know, some people might take that as very legalistic and telling us the rules and how we should act and do and what we can eat and can't eat and all that kind of thing. And they might think I'm being judgmental, so maybe they won't come. So I texted her again about two hours later, and I said, okay, um, I'm changing my sermon title. Paul's challenge to you. And then as I'm studying some more, I got to thinking, you know, people might not like having a challenge and might be afraid they might not be able to meet it. It might be kind of daunting, so they may not come. So then I texted her again. I said, final title, Paul's advice to you. And then the Friday before I preached it, I realized, you know, you can take someone's advice or leave it. You don't have to follow it. Maybe they won't take it seriously. So I'm going to ask you a question right now. If you could receive direct advice from the Holy Spirit, would you take it? Don't be too quick to answer. Think about that. If you could take advice. Maybe if the Holy Spirit came down in the dove and you knew it was from him, or maybe if a tongue of fire came down, you knew it was from the Holy Spirit. But I want to remind you that what's in this book, God's Word, it was inspired by who? The Holy Spirit. And so there's a new title, even though what's on the screen is what I chose for the, to use. The real title of this sermon is Paul's Inspired Paul's Holy Spirit inspired advice for you, for me. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This is really an important three verses of Paul's letter to the Romans. It's important because it tells us how we can live, how we can live the Christian life. What is what makes it possible for us to live the Christian life? And Clarissa is going to read to you now from the modern English version, Romans 12. And it says 1 to 2, but it actually is 1 through 3. 
This, this section, we usually just kind of read it by itself. Most of the time when we read through Romans, I mean, it's got 16 chapters. And that would take a while to read. And so we read it in sections. But I would remind you that while it's good to just focus on these pass- this passage, we need to remember that when Paul wrote this letter, According to chapter 16, it is believed that Phoebe, who had worked with Paul, took this letter that Paul was writing in Corinth and took it to Rome to be read in the church at Rome. And the way people would receive this letter of Romans from Paul was that it would be in a service or a meeting and someone would stand up and read the entire letter. That would take a while. That would take a while. And so as Paul is knows that as they're reading this letter, he's written a rather lengthy letter, and he knows that by the time he gets to what he's going to write now, he knows that people may have forgotten what he's already said. And and they may have a question in mind because of what he's written previously. And so I, I, I really believe that Paul starts out in verse one of chapter 12 that we have now, Paul starts out recognizing that there may be a question in many of the listeners' minds. And so he addresses that question. I think John James Montgomery Boyce puts it very well. And I agree with that, the fact of what this question is. He says, how shall we live in light of the fact that God has redeemed us from sin's penalty by the death of Jesus Christ and freed us from sin's tyranny by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul, Paul's answer is not in the very next sentence. Paul doesn't answer this question in the very next sentence, or the very next phrase. He begins by first giving them a reminder. Paul says, listen, I, I want to give you a reminder. And, and he starts out by saying in, in verse 1, I urge you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God. Of God. What's the reminder? Well, he says, I urge you. Now, the word in the Greek is much stronger than simply, I urge you. I can urge you to do something, but you could almost take that like advice. I'll take it or leave it. Paul is, is saying something like, I urge you very, very strongly. What, what I'm going to tell you next is extremely important. In fact, the, the word that he used was a word that should be translated exhortation. We don't use that word much. It, basically, what it means is, listen, what I'm going to tell you, you need to pay attention to and follow through on. Okay? I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, I urge you, therefore, by the mercies of God. Therefore, whenever you come to the word therefore, especially in the Bible, you need to be aware of what's preceded it, right? And what's preceded it is not just chapter 11 and the ending of chapter 11, which was a, be, which was a, a words of praise that, that Paul couldn't help but say. It's all of chapter 1. What we have now is chapter 1 through chapter 11. It's all that he has written prior to this. Everything he has said. Therefore, in view of or because of the mercies of God, what were the mercies of God? Well, in chapters 1 through 11, the mercies of God are first stated in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. Romans 1, 16 to 17, this is the theme of the book of Romans. Romans. 
hearing a bit of a ringing. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The mercies of God is the entire good news of the gospel. And Paul would, after giving that theme, he says, the power of God comes through the gospel, and I'm going to share what that gospel is. Now, I'm going to go briefly through the first 11 chapters. And if you aren't sure about it, perhaps you could read it later. But, but let me just share with you what Paul had already written to them. In verses 1, 1 verse 18 through 320, Paul says that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. Romans, uh, in, in Romans 1, 18, 3 to 20, he says, none of us are righteous, no, not one. We have all been caught red-handed before God. Right? And he says that we cannot atone for our own sins. We cannot measure up. That's the bad news. We all deserve the, the wrath of God, and the wrath of God is God's righteous reaction to sin. It's the fact that those who turn away from God choose to separate themselves from God who is the source of life. And so Paul says, what are we going to do? And then in chapter 3, verses 21 through 521, he tells us how God has provided through Jesus, how he's provided salvation to us. That through Jesus' death on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins, and through his resurrection, he enables us to live a new life. And we receive that by faith. We receive that by faith. And then he goes on in chapter 6, verses 1, 8 to 39, to show that just because we've been saved by faith and our sins have been forgiven, it doesn't mean we can do whatever we want to do, but now we are to continue living a resurrected life because we, were, we died when Christ died and we were raised when Christ was raised. For many years, that phrase being dying with Christ and raising with Christ, and Paul has a term he uses in most of his letters where he talks about the fact that we are in Christ. What does that mean? A number of months ago, I read a book by Watchman Nee on the book of Ephesians, and he used the following illustration. I have a here a hundred dollar bill and the reason I'm using a hundred dollar bill is because it's more valuable than a 20 if it was a 20 you wouldn't think much about it if I place this hundred dollar bill in this hymnal whatever happens to this hymnal happens to the hundred dollar bill is that correct if I lose it the hymnal the hundred dollar bill is lost if the hymnal should be burned up in a fire the hundred dollar bill would be burned up I set it up on a shelf the hundred dollar bill is on the shelf and so the illustration is and the reminder is is that we are now in Christ and when Christ died we died and when Christ rose we rose and when Christ ascended to heaven Paul says in Ephesians in Colossians we are seated next to him now in the heavenly places I'm going to take the hundred dollar bill out and put it back in <laughs> I don't want to forget it. And so Paul says, and then he tells us in, in chapter 8 that we are to live life by the power of the Spirit dwelling in us. Not focusing on do's and don'ts, but focusing on God, focusing on Jesus, whom when we behold him, we become changed. And so... Then he goes on in chapters 9, 1 through eleven thirty six. very difficult passage in which when people get caught up in the details of it, they get sidetracked. I think what Paul was trying to say in chapters 9 through 11 is simply this. There were Jews and Gentiles back then, and the Jews thought they were God's favored ones, and they were. But they relied on that instead of relying on God. They depended on that instead of depending on God. And they thought the Gentiles, which would be everyone else, 
Didn't matter if they were from Samaria, Rome, Greece, Ethiopia. Everyone else was a Gentile and they were outside of God's favor. And what what Paul was trying to get across was that God's mercy and grace that he described in the first part of the letter would be available to everyone and he could choose to give his mercy to whom he chose to give his mercy. And I'm just going to put a little thing aside. Sometimes we think we know who should be saved and who should be lost. And we need to give God credit for being able to give mercy to whomever he chooses to. Whether they belong to us or not. Whether they're good or not. Whether they're worthy or not. Do you get my message? So now, Paul comes down to his advice. What's interesting, before I forget, is that in chapters 1 through 11, everything about the salvation that is provided is provided by God and not by us. We receive it by trusting in what Jesus has done for us. Period. Period. So now we look at Paul's Holy Holy Spirit-inspired advice. And this is what he says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That word present is interesting. What it really means in the original language is when you put something at the disposal of someone else. Think about that for a section, for a second. I want you to present your bodies. I want you to put your bodies, your lives, and I want to, you to give that and put it at the disposal of God for him to use for his purpose and for his glory. Present your lives to God. He, he goes on. And he says, present your bodies. What body? He's not just talking about the physical body. That's part of it. He's talking about also our minds. He's talking about our emotions. He's talking about our wills. He's talking about every single part of us. He says, I want you to present your lives in total commitment as living sacrifices. Now, I don't know about you, but that word living sacrifices is kind of an oxymoron. A sacrifice is something that dies. The sacrifice that was put on the altar was put on the altar for one purpose, that the priest was going to take its life. And Paul says, no, no, I'm not asking you to die. I'm asking you to have a living sacrifice to God. Because, again, Romans 6, you have already died in Christ in order that you might rise to a new life. And you're to be a living sacrifice that you're placing and committing your entire lives at God's disposal. But I'm just going to make a confession right now, if that's okay. All too often, I want to crawl off the altar. Am I the only one? All too often, I, I want to jump off the altar. I want to do things my way, God, thank you. I don't think I'm the only one. You see, when we're committing all of our lives, he, he wants all, not part. And some, there's some parts of our lives, and it's different for different people. For some people, I, I, God, I can, I can pay my tithe and offerings, not, not a problem. Other people saying, how can I do that, God? And they struggle with it. He wants you to put all your life at his disposal. Some people say, you know, I I love, and don't get this wrong, I'm not trying to put together a list. When I was growing up, going to movies in the Adventist church, you didn't dare go in the theater. Right? And we used to ask the question, what's wrong with movies? And, And many of them at that time weren't that bad. Now, the majority of them are about one of two things, violence and sex. 
or sex and violence. And yet people have been numb to the point that they just keep feeding on that. So someone says, I don't want to give up my entertainment. For some, it's relationships. I don't want to give up my relationship. I'm in love. It's too important to me. Whatever your relationship is. When you know what's going against God's word. I'm not saying it's easy to be a living sacrifice. It requires much. But I would remind you of how much it required of Jesus to go to the cross and to die in our place. And so he asks us to be a living sacrifice. But then he goes on. And he says, listen, come to me. And he wraps his arms around us. He says, I want you to know that when you are a living sacrifice, you are holy. You are holy. You see, God's manifold mercies and extravagant grace are our motivation for offering our bodies as living sacrifices. You are holy. We, the word holy here is not talking about being perfect. It's talking about recognizing that we have, been set, we have set apart our lives for God and God has called us and he sees us as set apart for him. It's talking more about our relationship with God than it is about our behavior in this instance. Other places holy means behavior. And so he says, listen, when you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, recognizing that you are set apart, and because you have set apart your lives, and because of what Jesus has done, you are acceptable to God. You are acceptable to God. And he says, this is your reasonable service. This is your reasonable service of worship. William Barclay as he was making comments on this verse, recognized that what Paul is saying here in preparation for what he's going to write is not primarily talking about a worship service. He's talking about a dedicated life to serve God wherever. I like what William Barclay said in his daily Bible study when he commented on this passage. He said, real worship is the offering of everyday life to him and something transacted in a not something transacted in a church, but something which sees the whole world as the temple of the living God. A man may say, I'm going to church to worship God, but he should also be able to say, I'm going to the factory, the shop, the office, the school, the garage, the locomotive shed, the mine, the shipyard, the field, the buyer, or cow, cow barn, the garden to worship God. Now, when he wrote that, it was in the 1950s, shortly after World War II in Scotland. And he's writing to the culture that was there. How would we put this in our culture? What would we say we are going to do? Well, I think very readily what we could basically say is we are called to be a disciple and to be the hands and feet of Jesus where we live, work, and play. Where we live, work, and play. Next slide, please. So I want you to notice in your neighborhood, Laguna's Church School, the Junior, Laguna Junior Academy. Or, if you aren't going to Laguna Junior Academy, at whatever school you're going to. In your workplace, where you play. And I would add one more thing. We are called to be a disciple and to be the hands, feet, and mouth of Jesus. Not just to witness by example, but to share what a friend you have in Jesus and what Jesus has done for you, the changes he's made in your life. And so when we see life that way, it says that we are worshiping God 24-7. And I can hear someone say, wait a minute, Pastor, what about sleeping? If you're sleeping so that you can rest, so that the next day you can glorify God where you live, work, and play, in your sleep, you are worshiping because you are fulfilling the purpose he gave you. Paul gives his next piece of advice. Do not be transformed, Holy Spirit-inspired advice. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
Now, to be conform means in the worst sense, we just want to look like everybody else. We're under pressure. We want to be liked. We want to please other people. So we'll go along with them regardless of whether we think it's right or not. Now, there is a good aspect of being conformed at times. If I were with my family and we were asking where should we go to eat and I said Italian and everybody else said Mexican, I think it would probably be wise on my part to conform and go out to a Mexican restaurant. What do you think? There's nothing wrong with that. But if I'm at work and my boss asks me to fudge on a document, to lie on a document, will I conform to what he wants? Or will I stand up for what is right? You see the difference. When Paul says, do not be conformed to the world, the world was the culture around him, filled with idolatry, filled with... with, uh, cult prostitutes in the temple. It was, it was filled with greed and materialism. In our society today, our society is filled with secularism and humanism, which are very close together. Secularism says, we don't need God, thank you. We're going to take care of our problems ourselves. We're going to define what's right and wrong. God doesn't define that for us. Humanism says, goes one step farther. It says, we can solve all the problems of our life by ourselves, thank you. God is merely a crutch. Humanism either takes the form of agnosticism that says, I don't know if God exists, or atheism which says, I don't believe God exists. Either way, God is left out of their lives. And that's the culture we live in. We live in a culture of relativism that says, you decide what's right for you and what's wrong for you, and I'll decide what's right and wrong for me. And don't tell me that the Bible is, is, tells me what I should do. There are no absolutes. And what works for you is fine as long as it works for you. And what works for me is fine as long as it works for me. But have you noticed that those who say that end up saying what works for me is what you better believe in too? Have you experienced that? It's happening more and more. And then the last one is materialism. Materialism. You know the bumper sticker, the one with the most toys wins. The one with the biggest house wins. The one with the most money in the bank is to be followed. Character doesn't matter. That's the culture we live in. Paul says, don't be conformed to that culture, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what the word transform means? The word here is morphe. We get our word metamorphosis from it. A little while ago, my grandson was was so excited because in their classroom they were doing a science experiment. They had some eggs and those eggs were put in a jar and those eggs became a caterpillar and they put the right kind of, of leaves in there and the caterpillar kept eating the leaves and you know the rest of the story. One day the caterpillar is no longer a caterpillar, it's a chrysalis. And inside that chrysalis, it's being changed and transformed. And then it comes out a butterfly. And Paul used that word morphe because what he's saying is, God doesn't just say, I want to change your life. He says, your life being changed won't do. You need to be transformed. You need to be changed from the inside out. And only God can do that. Man can't replicate the metamorphosis from an egg to a caterpillar to a chrysalis to a, to a butterfly. Only God can do that. But what does it mean to have a renewed mind? And if this doesn't blow your, your mind, nothing will. Paul explains what it means to have a transformed mind in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. In that chapter, Paul is talking about the spiritual people who are spiritual versus those who aren't. And he says a person who isn't spiritual doesn't accept the teachings of God's spirit. He thinks they are nonsense. He can't understand them because a person must be spiritual to evaluate them. Spiritual people evaluate everything but are subject to no one's evaluation. Who has known the mind of the Lord so that he can teach him? However, I didn't say this. I took it from his word. We have the mind of Christ. 
Now, I want you to notice something. Paul doesn't say we should have the mind of Christ. Paul doesn't say we must have the mind of the Christ. Paul doesn't even say we will someday have the mind of Christ when we get to heaven. Paul says we have. And he doesn't say you have. He says we have because we understand the mind of Christ better together than we do by ourselves. I don't know how you see this, but to think that we can have the mind of Christ? How can that be? How will that take place? I, I want to say one more thing. I don't think Paul is primarily talking about having the theological truth as being the primary thing he's referring to as having the mind of Christ. Yes, that will be part of it. But I think Paul is preparing for what takes place in chapters 12 and on. And I would urge you to, in light of this message today, to go home and read especially chapters 12 and on. What he's really saying is that we need to have the mind of Christ in terms of how we relate and how we interact with others, especially those inside the church. So the question becomes, what was Christ's mind like when he was on this earth? If we have the mind of Christ, we will have the compassion of Christ. Christ came to reveal the character of the Father to God's people and to the world. What does it mean to have the compassion of Christ? It means that we will have the same compassion that Jesus showed in his ministry, a ministry that was available to all, a compassion that touched the needs of others, the compassion of Christ that was seen in the fact that he would sit down at a well with a Samaritan woman whom no other Jew would do, a compassion that was shown when he was willing to come in contact with and touch a woman with a, who'd been bleeding for, for 12 years. Now, I think that what Jesus did in touching her was probably more meaningful to her than him healing her. Because according to Jewish law, she hadn't been touched by anyone for 12 years. After going through COVID, can, I think we can understand a little more what touch and human touch means to us. And so he healed an unclean woman. Jesus, walking by the road one day, had compassion when he looked up and he saw a little man sitting in a tree. And he says, come down, even though he knew he was a tax collector who was a cheat and who used people and stole from them. I, I want you to think about the compassion of Christ that prayed for Peter that he might not fail. That compassion was motivated by his love, by the love of Christ, love for all, even love for his enemies, even those who had mistreated him and abused him. His love for Judas when he washed Judas' feet, knowing that Judas would betray him that very night. His love for, for those who had crucified him and put him on the cross when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And I would remind you that the nails didn't hold him there. My sins and yours held him there. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, we will have the same heart to serve that he had. Jesus said, I came to, not to be served, but to serve others and give myself, my life a ransom for many. A heart to serve and not to be served. To be willing, when possible, to see that others may do things differently in how they serve than you and I do. And so often, we've seen it in the worship wars, so often we get little details about what song or whatever. We get that and we let it come between. Why? I'm so tired of worship wars. And then... Jesus, we, if we're going to have the mind of Jesus, we will have a concern for the lost. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. But I think, as we think about having the mind of Christ, we will have the natural question arise. How in the world can you and I have the mind of Christ? I think it comes from abiding. It comes from reading the Bible regularly, not just for a few moments, a text for the day and a hand on the doorknob. 
but seriously reading the Bible. For years, it's been my practice that the very first question I ask when I read the Bible is, what does this passage tell me about God and his character? Because the Bible is to reveal God to us. After Dr. Kidder was here in, in March, I, he talked about someone he knew, Dr. Dwight Nelson from Parent Pioneer Memorial Church, would read a psalm every day. So I decided to do that. Instead of reading the psalm, I decided specifically to look at what does this psalm tell me about God and my relationship to him? It has been a wonderful, wonderful exercise. We're to abide through prayer, and please don't misunderstand. We can take our wants and our joys and our needs all to God. We can make our requests. That's perfectly well. But we spend so little time asking God, God, reveal yourself to me. We spend so little time saying, God, was it, is, is it my life that you want to transform at this time? We spend so little time saying, God, I'm weak in faith today. Many of you are aware that my, my son's going through cancer. And sometimes the only thing I can pray is, God, I believe. Help my unbelief. You, you know what I mean? Help my unbelief. Prayer is not just about getting our requests answered. Prayer is about bringing God into our lives in new and meaningful ways. You can abide in Christ through meditation. You can abide in Christ, the next slide please, through meditation. I like to meditate out in nature where I spend time thinking about and reflecting on what I've read in scripture, songs I sing, uh, Christian songs I sing. I spend time in worship and worshiping together. Those are the ways we have the mind of Christ. And it can't be off and on. It has to be regularly, daily, if possible. I'm going to share one thing I've done recently with you. Because, And please, don't take this personally. I'm talking about me, just me. I'm not saying what I did you have to do. I'm not going to condemn you if, if you do it. When I was interim pastor here, on my way up, during the week, and on the way back, I would turn on some of my favorite oldie songs that were on my phone and listen to them. And one day it hit me, maybe you shouldn't for a specific reason. And it's about the thought life. And so I quit listening to my oldies. Started listening to Christian music every day instead. I found that the battle of the mind wasn't nearly as hard as it used to be. That was what I needed. I am not saying you can't listen to anything but Christian music. Right? Okay, everybody got that? I'm saying what I needed. And God will reveal to you what you need to draw closer to him too when you take time to read the Bible, pray, meditate, and worship together. But Paul knows the human heart. And Paul knows that the human heart is still selfish to the core, even, among, even for a Christian. And he knows that the ego gets in the way. And sometimes when God works on us spiritually, it's awful easy for us to become prideful about our spirituality and to think we're better than others. So Paul gives one more piece of advice, and it won't take long to cover this. In verse 3, he says, Paul's Holy Spirit-inspired advice is to be humble. He doesn't use the word humble, but he describes it. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sound judgment according to the measure of faith God has distributed to every man. What does it mean to have sound judgment? It means to see ourselves through God's eyes and to see others through God's eyes. I love C.S. Lewis's definition of humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. I think that's a great definition. Paul says, listen, as you enter into this Christian life and as God begins to transform your, heart, your, minds, your lives, as he renews your mind so that you have the mind of Christ, he says, don't get proud you need to see yourself through the eyes of God always, and you need to see other through God's eyes always too. Because we're all broken and hurting people. 
And God works differently with each one of us in some respects. I believe chapter 12, verses one, these three verses are important because I believe they are the fulcrum between the first 11 chapters and the rest of the book. They take it from what Jesus has done for us and they take it to how we're going to treat others, interact with others, and how we're going to relate to others. It's kind of like a teeter-totter, and, and in my PowerPoint, the te this teeter-totter that's on the screen would move, okay? So it takes us from, as we think about Romans 1 through, through 11, it takes us from receiving the mercy and grace of God for ourselves to expressing the mercy and grace of God to others. Do you, do you see that? That's why I urge you, read chapter 12 and on after the sermon sometime. Because it talks about how we're going to interact with others because we are being transformed and we are being given the mind of Christ. I am going to close this message. I have three people up here who are going to read this passage again. This passage that contains... Paul's Holy Spirit-inspired, urgent, exhorted advice to you and to me. Listen carefully as they read it. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters... By the mercies of God, that you may present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say... Through the grace given to me, to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sound judgment, according to the measure of faith God has distributed to every man. The, bened the benediction will be given by the congregation. The singers are going to come up. And they are going to lead us in a very familiar old hymn, I Surrender All. We've talked about our lives being living sacrifices. I'm asking you to sing this song as your prayer to God, to tell him that you are willing to surrender your lives. And at the end of the, the song, that will close the service. So would you stand as we sing the benediction together? <laughs> 
was so wonderful to see all of you.